So thankful to God for allowing us to enter into his court of praise uh, in an awesome time of worship, just reminding ourselves that we serve a promise-keeping God, that his word is true, his word is et eternal, not an iota, not a dot will be removed from his word. So thankful for the opportunity that we have to physically gather together to lift up the name of Jesus and to learn from his word. Um, as you know, we've been diving into the Sermon on the Mount in our first series of 2021. And this week, the idea is just to continue where we left off. And like I mentioned in previous weeks, I like to think of the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus's code of conduct, as our kingdom code of conduct, as ambassadors of Christ, as his disciples here on earth. We aspire to model the characteristics of the kingdom as a family of God. And truthfully, some aspects of the Sermon on the Mount are easier to swallow than others, especially considering where we are as a culture uh, and where we are in the history of the church. You can preach on things like forgiveness, you can do an exposition on the Lord's Prayer, and you'll probably get little to no resistance. You'll probably get a lot of amens. On the other hand, some of the other teachings within the Sermon on the Mount and some of the other teachings of Jesus Christ are a lot more personal, they're a lot more uncomfortable, a lot more confrontational, and as a result, the sad truth is that the wider church has shied away from some of the more touchy and confrontational passages within the Sermon on the Mount to focus on some of the more easy passages, the more positive, the more encouraging teachings. But here's what we need to grasp before we get into any of this, and as it relates to the Sermon on the Mount in general, it's that you and I do not get to choose what teachings we can obey and what teachings we can ignore. We don't get to make that choice. Being a disciple is not like eating at a buffet where you can go down the list of menu items and choose the ones that you like and pass on the ones that you don't like. The Sermon on the Mount is to be understood as a package deal. It's an all or nothing proposition. We have to deal with the difficult truths just as much as we have to deal with those that are easier to swallow. Simply put, the Sermon on the Mount this evening is either going to challenge you to grow in your faith or it's going to offend you about the faith. You're either going to be challenged to grow in the faith or it's going to offend you about the faith. There's no in-between. Some of you that are in this room and are watching online will hear what I'm about to say and be instantly turned off. Your wall will go up. Whatever I tell you will go in one ear and out the other. But my prayer is that that will not be the case for you this evening. That by the power of the Holy Spirit and only by his power, that most of us will be softened in our hearts that we will be receptive to the power of the Holy Spirit, to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and that we will collectively as a family of God strive to live the kind of life that pleases God, that brings glory to his name, because God's glory is what it is all about, not about our comfort. It's about God's glory. And so with that in mind, we're going to be getting into one of the more challenging passages, maybe in all of Scripture, uh, but particularly within the Sermon on the Mount. One that is, I believe, probably more important to cover than maybe any other time in our history, particularly in the Western world and the country that we live in. And specifically today, we're going to be talking about an elephant in the room conversation on the subject of divorce. Now, as a show of hands, how many of you have heard a message on the subject of divorce in the church? I see zero hands. And that is kind of the point that I'm trying to make because Jesus explicitly teaches on this subject, yet we have avoided any meaningful discussion on this subject as though marital issues are things that we don't struggle with. But we all do, if we're being truthfully honest. And so in Matthew chapter 5, verses 31 to 32, this is what we read. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her com commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman makes her commit adultery. Now, 
before getting into the nitty gritty of this text, which is difficult, I think it's immediately obvious why the church tends to avoid this subject. And that is because without question, Jesus sets the bar for divorce much higher than the culture that we live in as it relates to what are the just causes for divorce. And the truth is, and I hate to say this, as a church, we have been guilty of softening our stance towards this issue of divorce, either by softening our teaching or by passively not mentioning the subject whatsoever, sort of just avoiding any conversation about the subject. But here, we see that Jesus sets the bar, at least in this very specific passage, at sexual immorality. He sets the bar for divorce at adultery, being sexually unfaithful in the context of a married relationship. In other words, adultery is the only lawful pretext for divorce. That's it. Culture, on the other hand, sets a much different bar. Today, if we look at the culture around us, essentially the bar for divorce is set at no-fault divorce based on irreconcilable differences. How many of us have heard that term tossed around, irreconcilable differences? And I just want to make a quick comment on that term. I've been married to Lena for six years, six blessed years of marriage. Some of you in this room have been married for longer than I have, maybe a lot longer than I have. But I think that you and I can probably all agree, at least those of us who are in marriage, that marriage is by definition to a large degree about navigating through a ocean of irreconcilable differences. That's the definition of marriage. The truth is that God rarely brings two people together that are completely alike in terms of their personalities and preferences. In fact, he probably never does. More often than not, you either have a spouse or you will marry a spouse that is in many ways the polar opposite of yourself. That's the reason why opposites attract is a cliche in the first place because it is true. And this is true because God has always intended marriage to be complementary. I'm going to use my marriage as an example so I don't have to call any of you out. But I have certain attributes, certain tendencies, certain personality traits that Lena doesn't have. And Lena has certain qualities, attributes, and traits that I don't have. And while the differences that we have can certainly be a cause for friction, I don't deny that, the beauty of our differences is that we can compensate for each other's deficiencies and ultimately we can be better together as a unit than we are apart. As a married couple, we, using a Power Rangers reference, become sort of a megazord. We're better than the individual components. We're better together. For example, I am not a gifted planner. Lena's probably nodding her head very vigorously right now. I tend to gloss over details. I tend to procrastinate anything that relates to planning, particularly as it relates to travel planning. I'm horrible at it. And on the other hand, Lena is an amazing planner. She should be a travel agent. You should hire her. She's that good. She thinks about all the details and the minutia. She thinks about the airtime, she thinks about the difference between, she thinks about the difference of, uh, in, in commute time between different locations. She thinks about how close the Airbnb is to all the local restaurants. She thinks about so many different things that I wouldn't think about. I would just drop my money and pay for a random all-inclusive resort. But Lena thinks through all the details. And I'm thankful for that. Because, G, because Lena is the planner that she is, I get to go on way more stimulating and enjoyable vacations and I'm much more well-traveled than I would have been if I didn't meet her. She thinks through all the minutia. I'm also challenged in the kitchen. I am horrible in the kitchen. I can make sandwiches, I can make a peanut butter and jelly, I can make a tuna fish sandwich, I make a mean egg and cheese sandwich, but between my extremely slow chopping skills and my frequent incessant need to glance at the recipe on my phone, and then the phone screen goes into sleep mode. Then I have to retype in my password and then reset my phone screen. Between all of that herky-jerky stuff, I probably take two hours to make the same recipe that Lena will take 30 minutes to make. That being said, I am an extremely neat person. I have sort of OCD about keeping a clean home. So cleaning is something that I don't mind doing. I can wash dishes. I can unload the dishwasher. I can vacuum the house. I can wash and fold laundry. I can take out the trash. You don't have to tell me to do those things. I will do that because it will annoy me if it's not done. So between Lena's amazing cooking skills 
and my assistance with cleaning, we've been able to complement each other reasonably well. At least I think so. And I'm on stage, so I get to say that. You can ask Lena what she thinks after this service is over to get an honest perspective. But the whole point is that in marriage, and I think this is a practical piece of advice, especially if you're young in your marriage, learn not to focus on the differences between you and your spouse. Learn not to look at your differences as a point of argumentation or contention or as culture would call it, an irreconcilable difference. Instead, use your differences. Leverage the God-given differences that you have to complement each other, to become stronger together as a unit, to become a more effective partnership. Secondly, I want to be really sensitive this evening. I don't want to make light of the fact that divorce is a very personal subject and it's a very painful subject for some people, especially if you're in this room or if you're watching online and you're struggling in your marriage or you find yourself physically separated from your spouse or you are divorced already. But the reason why I am so convicted to look at marriage from Jesus's point of view is because there is a substantial amount of evidence to suggest that the world's approach to marriage and the world's approach to divorce is not working. It is not working. In fact, it is a horrific disaster. Did you know that one divorce occurs globally every 36 seconds? Do you know that? That 2,400 divorces occur per day. And contrary to what you might think, multiple marriages are not more successful than the first one. The divorce rate for first marriages is 42%, which is already pretty bad. For second marriages, it goes up to 62%. For third marriages, it is a whopping 73% divorce rate. In other words, the more you try to resolve your marital issues by further iterations of marriage, it never gets better. It only gets worse. And the fallout from divorce goes way beyond just hurt feelings between the husband and the wife. It's way beyond bitterness and resentment between husbands and wives. Children are collateral damage. Grandparents are impacted, having to absorb more childcare responsibilities. Close friendships often become distant, become strained. It becomes awkward to hang out with the couples that you used to hang out with once you're split because all of a sudden you feel like the third wheel when you're hanging out with other married couples. And so getting back to this theme passage, the first part of Matthew 5 verse 31 reads this. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. Here, we see that Jesus directly quotes from the Old Testament, specifically quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And this is what we read in that contextual passage. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce... So that's the context from which Jesus is making his statement. In this passage, in Deuteronomy, we see that the criteria for divorce is indecency. In some translations, we see the word used uncleanness, depending on which version you're reading. And the reason why Jesus quotes this verse is because during the time in which Jesus pronounced the Sermon on the Mount, there were two opinions as it related to what are the reasonable and just causes for divorce. And what exactly the Old Testament meant by using the word indecent or unclean. And what Jesus is essentially doing in this teaching in the Sermon on the Mount is he's settling this age-old debate once and for all in terms of what is the appropriate reason to get divorced. Now, there was a liberal school of thought and there was a conservative school of thought as it related to what indecent means. The liberal interpretation was pretty much anything a woman did that displeased her husband. Remember that... The time in which Jesus ministered was a patriarchal society. So this was always from the husband's point of view. So if the woman did anything, and I mean anything, that made her husband unhappy, according to the liberal school of thought, that was a just cause for divorce. And here are just a few of the reasons. And these are documented reasons. I'm not exaggerating. This stuff is actually historically documented. One of the reasons, when she didn't find grace in his sight. I don't even know what that means. But that was a just cause for divorce. If she went out on the street with her hair loose, so make sure you bring your scrunchies with you, otherwise you're at risk. If she spins around in public, just cause for divorce. If she converses with any man that is not her husband, 
get this one. If she burns his dinner, that's it. We're throwing you out on the street. You're on your own. If she is a noisy woman, and the definition of noisy per the liberal school of thought, yes, they did drill down the definition. If a woman's voice can be heard in the house next door to your house, that is what defines a noisy woman. And so these were all justifiable reasons for divorce based on the liberal interpretation. And I think that that interpretation pretty much aligns with where we are today as a society, that we can pretty much dissolve the married relationship for any reason. Now, the more conservative school of thought was that unclean or indecent specifically referred to infidelity or adultery. That was it. It was very specific and limited. And so coming back to our theme verse, we clearly see that Jesus aligns himself with the conservative interpretation. Looking at verse 32, we read, But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery. In other words, an illegitimate divorce leads to adultery because God doesn't recognize that divorce in the first place. To put it differently, it is possible for a person to be divorced or to have a divorce that is recognized by the state of New Jersey legally, but that divorce is not recognized by God. If that person goes on to marry someone else after divorcing their first spouse, God considers that future relationship to be adultery because he sees the person as lawfully married to his original spouse. That marriage is still intact. And so simply put, what Jesus is trying to say in a nutshell, and as we've already mentioned, the only justifiable reason for divorce per the teaching of Christ is adultery. That's it. That is the bar that Jesus is setting. But that being said, note what Jesus does not say. I think what he doesn't say is just as important as what he does say. Jesus did not say that adultery requires divorce. He said that adultery is a justifiable reason for divorce, but he does not say that adultery requires divorce. In other words, and granted, this will not be for everyone. I understand this. But reconciliation between husband and wife has always been and will always be the will of God. That will always be the preferred option. Divorce is never the option, according to the heart of God. If the unfaithful spouse, whoever is guilty of adultery, is genuinely remorseful, is genuinely penitent, is genuinely repentant, and the spouse who is the victim is willing to forgive that guilty spouse and move forward, then God can heal a marriage that has been compromised by adultery. He can do that. He is doing that. He is continuing to do that to this day. And he can do that in your marriage. If you are watching this, if you're in this room and your marriage is struggling, God can heal your marriage. Yes, it's going to take a lot of prayer. It'll take a lot of Christian marital counseling, a lot of swallowing your pride and your ego, a lot of grace, a lot of forgiveness. The work of the Holy Spirit must be paramount in that situation. But nothing is impossible for God. He can bring two people that are the furthest apart as far as the east and the west, and he can bring them back together into a loving relationship. My God can do that. And this has happened and continues to happen. We get a little bit more insight into Jesus' teaching on divorce in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 to 9. And this is what we read. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it wasn't so. In other words, that wasn't God's intent from the beginning. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Here we see with even more clarity that God never in his original design desired divorce to be a part of the human experience. That God fundamentally hates divorce. 
and that it grieves the heart of God when we break a covenant that he established. Understand this. Marriage is not a contract that you and your wife sign. Marriage is a covenant that is established by God. When God instituted marriage in the Garden of Eden, he created it as a picture of the greatest unity that human beings can experience. That ultimately when we understand marriage, it has always intended to function as a picture of a greater reality. The covenantal union between Christ, who is our bridegroom, and the church, that is you and me. We are the bride of Christ. We are covenantally united with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ once we declare him to be our Lord and Savior through his redemptive work. When a husband and wife chooses to violate, to dissolve the covenantal relationship of marriage, it mars the ultimate picture that God is trying to show in our marriage, which is the union between Christ, the bridegroom, and his church. Malachi gives us even another reason why God hates divorce. He says he is seeking godly offspring. In other words, God's design for the family was that one man and one woman commit themselves covenantally to each other for life and raise children to understand that very same concept of covenant as well. Children that are raised in a healthy two-parent home have a far greater likelihood of establishing successful marriages themselves. And so, again, the whole point that I'm trying to make is that adultery, again, is the only just, valid cause for divorce. That being said, for the sake of thoroughness, I do want to mention at least a second reason for divorce that is allotted in Scripture. And that is something we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 to 16. This is what we read. And this is the words of Paul the Apostle. To the married I give this charge, not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say, I am saying this, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce him. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his believing wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. In this passage, we see that Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. And he makes one additional allowance beyond Jesus. And he's saying this in his own words as a practical wisdom. Namely, that when an unbelieving spouse abandons a believing spouse, that is a lawful reason for divorce. And even in this rare circumstance, I need to emphasize that if you find yourself today married to an unbeliever, you are obliged as a child of God to fight to keep that marriage together. That is your responsibility. Your responsibility as a believer is to try to win your unbelieving spouse to the Lord. Divorce should not be on the table as far as the perspective of the believer. You are always trying to be an evangelist in your marriage. You're always trying to win your spouse over as far as you can help it. That being said, because this passage alludes to it, I have to touch on this practical piece here, which is from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, and this is what we read. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Now, while this particular verse is not restricted to counsel on marriage, it has a lot of relationships to marriage. It has a lot of implications for marriage. In other words, this is the godly wisdom that Paul is trying to communicate. Do not flirt to convert. Do not flirt to convert. I hope that's clear. For a Christian, dating a non-Christian is unwise. It is unwise. And marrying a non-Christian is not an option. It's not an option. And the imagery of this passage is of two incompatible oxen sharing the same yoke. 
instead of working together to simultaneously pull a load, they would actually be working against each other, pulling the load in opposite directions. In other words, there can be no spiritual harmony in marriage between a Christian and a non-Christian. And Paul goes on to remind us as believers that we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit who inhabits our hearts at the point of our salvation. And because of that, we are called to be separate from the world. In other words, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And nowhere is that principle more important than in the most intimate relationship we can get into, and that's marriage. The Bible also says don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Having any kind of intimate relationship with an unbeliever can quickly turn into something that is a hindrance to your walk with Jesus Christ. Yes, and I don't want us to get this twisted, we are called to evangelize to unbelievers. That is what the Great Commission is all about. But we are not called to be intimate relationally with unbelievers. That's the distinction. There is nothing wrong with building friendship with an unbeliever. We need to do that in order to be effective evangelists, to win people far from God into a relationship with him. We need to be friendly with unbelievers. But that is as far as we can go as children of God. If you are here this evening or if you're watching online and you're dating an unbeliever, honestly, just be honest. Don't pontificate. Be honest. What would be your priority, romance or winning that person to Christ? What is your priority? If you were married to an unbeliever, how would the two of you cultivate spiritual intimacy in your marriage? You're both going in opposite directions. How can a quality marriage be built and maintained if you disagree on the most important issue in your life? And that is the person and work of Jesus Christ. How can you possibly sail in the same direction if at the core of your married relationship you are in a state of disagreement? Remember, the call of Jesus Christ to all of us is to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. How can you follow a master who demands such a high standard if you choose to be covenantally connected or to become one flesh with absolute allegiance to a person who ignores that very truth? How is that even possible? And so the point that I'm trying to make, and this is just the Holy Spirit speaking, be wise, who you choose to marry will have a profound impact on your future. Not just in terms of your long-term success in keeping your marriage together in the first place, but also in terms of something even more important. That's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Even the salvation of your future children are at stake if you get together with an unbeliever. And remember, this is the plan of Satan all along, to destroy the foundation of the family because it's not just your family that will be damaged, it is your second generation, your third generation, your fourth generation. Remember, the cause for the downfall of the children of Israel was unwise, unsanctioned marital alliances. That is the reason why those who knew God in the wilderness completely forgot him within one generation because of being yoked with unbelievers. And so, be humble. If you're dating someone who's not a believer, I urge you by the power of the Holy Spirit, be humble. I know it's not easy, but be humble. Listen very carefully to the advice of those who know you and love you best. Don't dismiss it. They're not saying it to make you unhappy. They're saying it because they're concerned about your eternal well-being more than your present happiness. And I get it. I am not trying to minimize how excruciatingly difficult it can be to get out of a relationship with someone who you've been dating for a long time. I get that. Someone who you've grown to love, someone whose heart it would crush you to break, even more than breaking your own heart, you would be afraid of breaking the other person's heart. But know this, and please know this, there is no one that is worth more than your intimacy with Jesus Christ. There is no one worth more than your relationship with Christ. As Christians, your first allegiance and my first allegiance has to be Jesus Christ. Above anyone, above our wife, above our husband, above our children, we are called to be first in allegiance to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so you and I have to, at all costs, protect the pearl of great price. We sell everything to hold on to and protect that pearl. And so with that said, and this is just counsel to you, because I know 
that ultimately, if you're in a dating relationship, it will lead to marriage. So choose your dating partner wisely. With that said, I do want to make a brief mention of separation. The Bible does allow for separation. And in some circumstances, I believe separation is actually a wise course of action, especially if you're in a married relationship and your spouse is physically abusive to the wife, husband, or to the children. If there is physical abuse, I strongly advise separation. But understand this, the biblical concept of separation is not the same as the cultural perspective towards separation. Biblically speaking, separation is always part of a process towards reconciliation. On the other hand, culture teaches that separation is simply step one towards the divorce. You see the difference? In biblical principle, separation is a path towards reconciliation. Culturally, separation is just step one towards an inevitable divorce. And the reason why culture looks at it that way is because it gives spouses the free license to start playing the field before they actually sign the dotted line on the paper. Christian separation is not a license to start dating and exploring your other dating options. Again, it is intended to be a step for a season in the longer process towards healing a marriage. And I know, again, this is a tough subject and some people will say, but you don't know how bad and how horrific my marriage is. You don't know how bad my situation is. And you're right. I don't know how bad your situation is. Marriage is complicated, it is difficult, and for many, it can be a very painful relationship. But I'm not here on stage giving my opinion. I'm not. I have no right to redefine what God has sovereignly declared in his divine will. I have no right to change or to redefine or renegotiate what Jesus has clearly communicated as his will as it relates to marriage and specifically on divorce. And in summary, Jesus hates divorce. He hates it. If there's anything that you get out of this, is that God hates divorce. And that there are only two grounds for divorce, and those are a last resort, not a first resort. The only two grounds are adultery and abandonment. That's it. And even with those legitimate grounds, reconciliation is and still will always be God's will. And why do I say that? Why do I keep repeating that? Because that's precisely what God does for you and for me. He reconciles us to himself. As horrible, as difficult, as painful, as excruciating as your situation might be as you're listening to me this evening, just be reminded that you and I have treated God much worse than you can even treat your spouse. We've treated God way worse. You and I were serial adulterers. We cheated on God time and time and time again, worshiping created things instead of our creator. God had every right to divorce us. He had every right to send us into the lake of fire for all eternity. But instead of leaving us high and dry, he forsook his own son, even but for a moment, allowing him to absorb the punishment and separation that you and I deserved as our substitute and cloaking us with the righteousness of Christ. In Christ, we who are far from God, we who are bitter enemies of God, are now adopted sons and daughters of the Most High God. Do you understand how amazing that is? That you are sons and daughters of the Most High God? We are the church. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. And one day, my Savior is going to return, and we are going to be reunited with our bridegroom, Jesus. We're going to be with him for all eternity. That's how much God loves us. He fought to reconcile us to himself. He didn't have to, but because of his amazing grace, we have the opportunity to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. That is the grace that God has lavished upon us. And that is why it is our call, as difficult as it might be, to fight tooth and nail, to climb every mountain, to scale every mountain, to exhaust every possible option to keep our marriage covenants intact, to not reflect the brokenness and division of the world around us, but to reflect the unconditional love of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is our call. That is your call. That is my call. And finally, I want to say this. If you are watching this and you are divorced, maybe even re-divorced and remarried, please know that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. It's not. 
Adultery is not the unpardonable sin. Just ask David. David was called the man after God's own heart, and he cheated on his wife. Multiple times, in fact. You may not be able to change your past, but you can entrust your life and your current marriage to Jesus today. Know that God is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love. God is faithful to forgive and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. You can entrust your life and your marriage to Jesus today. You can choose Jesus' way, covenantal commitment over the world's broken and faulty way. We can fight as a family of God to keep our marriages Christ-centered and together and strong. We can show our children, our future generations, what unwavering marital commitment looks like. That even if we get into our little arguments here and there, we always come back to the throne room of grace as a family and reconcile before the sun goes down. So that our children can have a shot at a godly marriage of their own and pass that to their children 20, 30, 40 years from now. And also know this, as a church family, we are here for you if you're struggling in your marriage. I know that in our community, it's very embarrassing to admit that you're struggling in marriage, but that's such a tragedy. The church should be a place of healing. The church should be a place where you can bring your deepest burden and be honest and vulnerable and find grace, find hope, find solutions, not find judgment. And so I'm telling you that if you are struggling in your marriage, don't try to put up that facade and pretend that everything is okay. Seek help. Talk to your pastor. Talk to an elder in your church. Talk to me. I don't come with any judgment. I'm not here to pontificate and tell you how bad you are. My goal is to get you closer to Jesus. It's always been the goal. It will always be the goal. We are here for you. We are all sinners in need of the grace of God. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. And please, don't be ashamed to come to this church or any Christ-centered, biblically-sound church. The best thing that you can do if you're struggling in your marriage is to be with the family of God. To be around other people who are just as flawed as you, who are striving by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit to reflect Jesus better and better each and every day. We will be here to pray for you. We will be here to encourage you. We will be here to hold you accountable. We will be here to share our bread and our homes with you. We will be here for you. And I'm sorry that if our church has looked the opposite way to people who are struggling in their marriage, but that's no longer the case. We are here for you. We want to extend the grace of Christ to you so that you can keep your marriages intact. And so with that being said, may God strengthen us. And this is only going to happen with God's strength. May God strengthen us as husbands, as wives, as future husbands and wives, as a church family to cultivate thriving, Christ-centered, joyful, peaceful, harmonious marriages. Pray together as a couple. Study the Bible together as a couple. Make decisions together as a couple. Attend church together as a couple. And keep dating, even after you gave your spouse the ring. Keep dating, even in marriage. And always, always keep Jesus at the center. He is the thread that binds you together. If he isn't at the center, then your marriage doesn't have much hope. Keep Jesus at the center. And with that, let's just stand up in God's presence and just enter back into a time of worship and reflection. And let's just pray for one another. Generally, Father, Lord Jesus, we just thank you and we praise you for this amazing opportunity that you have given to us as a family of God to gather together to celebrate your matchless name, to hear from your timeless word. Father God, we pray, Lord, that you would soften our hearts to receive what it is that you're communicating. Father, we're so grieved when we look at the world around us and see the condition of the family, see how broken families are, see husband and wives with animosity towards each other split. See children in single-parent homes. God, this is not what you intended. And Father, we're so sad to see that this concept of divorce has even infiltrated your church, your bride. Father God, we apologize for not speaking boldly on this issue. But Father God, if there is anybody who is struggling in their marriage, if there's anybody who is separated, if there's anybody who is considering divorce, I pray, Lord God, that your word would go forth with power that Satan would not be allowed a foothold in our homes. Father, that we would build our married relationships on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. 
Father, this evening we remember that you are a promise-keeping God, that you have covenantally promised to be with us always, that you will never leave us or forsake those who have accepted you as the Lord and Savior of our life, and that you will scale every mountain, that you will leave the 99 to chase after the one. That is your commitment to us. And so, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray that we would be able to emulate you as far as the love that we show to our spouse. Father, we just pray for unity. Father, we pray for reconciliation in marriage. We pray for peace. We pray for joy. We pray for harmony. This has been a difficult season for many. People are trapped in the house. Emotions are high. Stress is high. It can be an easy situation to get mad at a spouse or to hold on to bitterness and resentment. But Father God, we pray that you would bring healing into our home, that you would bring joy, that you would bring peace, that we as the city on a hill, as your light, as your salt, would be an example to a broken world around us of what a God-fearing, kingdom-centered, Christ-centered family looks like. Help us, Lord Jesus. We give you all glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray.